Hi, welcome to Living Healthy, where we're here to help you make sense of a nonsensical healthcare world. I'm Dr. Barton Bishop, Chief Clinical Officer of Sport and Spine Rehab. Each week, we bring you a distinguished guest who is nationally recognized in their field of healthcare, and today is no different. My co-host is Dr. Jay Greenstein, CEO and founder of Sport and Spine Rehab, and our distinguished guest this week is Dr. Alan Glazier. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So welcome. I'm, uh, I'm going to call you Alan because I've known Dr. Glazier here, Alan, for uh, quite some time. We went to college together, and it's a great privilege to have you here. We even started uh, our practices together pretty much at the same time, right? Yes, we did. We did. Yeah, we did a community center lecture together. I think there were three people there, my mother, my dad, and <laughs> one other person. And you talked about eye care. The person I care. That's my care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really great to have you here. Lots of things have changed with you uh, over the past um, several years. I mean, you've, you've become quite a nationally renowned optometrist. So tell us about yourself and, and your practice and, and how you've become so n nationally recognized and influential. Uh, you're too kind. Um, the, my practice is Shady Grove Eye and Vision Care. and It's located uh, on Shady Grove Road at the corner of Research and Shady Grove. And uh, I uh, built the practice up, added some doctors over the years. We took on some specialties and were willing to tackle some problems that, that frankly are often overlooked by other eye care practices or maybe brushed under the rug. And I, I think by really focusing on the care aspect of taking care of people, uh, we built quite, quite, a, quite a practice together, all my employees as well. Um, I didn't call it Shady Grove Eye and Vision Center. I called it Shady Grove Eye and Vision Care because that's what we provide, uh, good eye care. It's great. I know because I'm one of your patients, so I agree. Thank well, you. speaking of eye care, um, what, are, what are three things that people can do? to take care of their eyes. I mean, these are obviously vital structures that often, no pun intended, go overlooked. So what are some things that our, that our guests, that was pretty good, what are some things that our guests can do? No, tons of puns today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the conversations about eyes. Um, well, the first thing is to have an annual eye exam. Um, whether you f feel you're seeing clearly and have no problems or not, most eye conditions go underdiagnosed and undiagnosed because there aren't always symptoms. Uh, blindness is thought of something as something that is blackness or darkness, and so you think you would know when you're going blind, but blindness is actually a loss of perception. So a good example is if you put your hand behind your head, you can't see it because you don't have perception back there. Well, blindness like, is like that also. The, the beginning symptoms of most blindness is you start bumping into things and you don't know why. So, so annual eye exams are important to, to help address conditions that otherwise may have been preventable if, um, if you had been being seen regularly. Uh, the second thing is if you have sudden loss of vision or uh, flashes of light or floaters, to don't wait for them to go away. Usually when they go away, uh, that's a bad thing. Um, they, they may lead to greater problems, so go see your eye doctor. And one of the biggest concerns in our society nowadays also is the progressively worsening vision uh, with myopia or nearsightedness where your eyes your prescription changes year after year after year every time you go to the doctor and your lenses get thicker and thicker. And that's a big concern. In our world, which is mostly near, uh, using computers, reading, uh, sitting in cubicles at work, these are all things that have been shown to contribute to this worsening of myopia. So by, by exercising your eyes in the sense of looking out a window, reminding your brain it needs to see near and far as opposed to just near, you can help yourself in some ways, they, the scientists believe, to slow down this worsening vision. So there are things we can actually do to prevent it. It's not like arthritis where people think once you get arthritis it's just going off a cliff and there's nothing you can do. There are things we can do to slow this rate of regression of our eyes. There, there are things that are suggested. There are studies that have shown some positive correlations with ways to slow down the worsening in some types of refractive errors. Yeah. And there are exercises that people can, can try as well, correct? So exer eye exercise is sometimes called vision therapy. Mm -hmm. is very effective for certain eye conditions. Recently, there was the first uh, double-blind randomized controlled study that showed that it worked. It had been thought to have worked for many years, and people had benefited from it. Um, there's a f book out that's an amazing book called Fixing My Gaze, which talks about a PhD's uh, travels through vision problems that were ultimately fixed by vision therapy. It's good for certain problems, and it's not good for other problems. There's unfortunately a lot of people on the Internet offering therapy uh, cures for, for conditions that aren't cured by therapy, uh, which kind of mars the whole picture for the, the real therapists who do a really good job at correcting the conditions that can be corrected with therapy. That's, that's very interesting. You know, for me... Um I'm at a restaurant and I'm looking at a menu and it's dark and the print is small and, you know, I'm having my challenges reading and a lot of my friends are the same age and they're saying, yeah, you know, it's getting more and more difficult to read 
up close, especially in a dark environment, with my current lenses or with my glasses, you know, that seems to be a pretty common problem. Can you tell us how we can, how we can deal with those issues and, and what are some treatments that are available out there, some, some options for us? Sure. And maybe more importantly, how I can prevent this because I don't have this issue. <laughs> he's, he's not old enough I'm yet. just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, I, we call it, uh, we call it um, short arm syndrome. The, the technical word is presbyopia. Mm -hmm. And presbyopia, it depends how the glass is. If it's half full, it's, it's a good thing that you get it because it means you're alive. For most of human evolution, we didn't live past the age of 38, so this was not a problem. But as we live longer and longer, we, we experience these problems. Everything from uh, presbyopia to cataracts, ultimately, hopefully not macular degeneration. So, so these are problems that will occur with time. Presbyopia is uh, due to a progressive hardening of the lens inside of the eye uh, that, that gradually over time cannot fine-tune your vision for close distances. So things go out and out and out. Ultimately, those people's those people, if they're corrected to 2020, can't see the food on their plate. Mm -hmm. um, so it will happen. It'll happen to you. Um, for nearsighted uh -huh. people, <laughs> for nearsighted people, they can take off their glasses and read. For farsighted people, they often have to start wearing glasses. Hmm. Um, I'm I'm wearing a bifocal contacts now. That the technology is there. It works very well. And that's when you come in next. That's one of the things we're going to be talking about. And in a lot of ways, these lenses are like getting your young eyes back. Mm -hmm. So the, the technologies are there to help us with these problems now. It's taken about 20 years for them to evolve into into technologies that that work and are sufficient. But you know what's great about you is you're always on the leading edge of technology. And, and one of the things that, that we know that you're doing now in your practice is you're offering this new, unique treatment for these dry and irritated eyes that people suffer from every single day of their lives. So, so can you tell us about that? It, it's very common uh, when you suffer from dry eyes to go doctor to doctor and be given the same options all the time. Take drops, put drops in your eyes. Uh, and it would make sense when you hear dry and you think of a treatment for dry, add moisture. Well, the research has shown, first of all, these are generally ineffective treatments for the majority of people with dry eye, and we didn't really understand why until recent research has shown that most dry eye is not caused by lack of moisture in the eye, but by a missing component in the tears that keeps the moisture from evaporating. So f picture a, a glass of water three quarters of the way full, and pour olive oil on top of it and sit it on a desk. The water, the oil will sit on top of the water. The water will never evaporate. Mm -hmm. It'll stay there forever. Um, when the oil is thin or maybe a poor quality oil and the water can seep through it, it will evaporate. And the oils are produced in the eye, are produced by these glands in the eyelids called meibomian glands. Not to get too technical, but there hadn't been any good treatments for this, what we call evaporative dry eye. And uh, do Dr. Uh, Donald Korb, a famous optometrist in Boston, invented this machine LipaFlow. When I heard about it years ago, I said, I got to get me one of them because these are patients that I rec the, my only treatment for them is to recommend they use warm, moist compresses on their eyes at least four times a day. Nice. Imagine having to do that That's in the middle lot. of your workday. Yeah. If, oh, yeah. if you're somebody who wears makeup, I mean, it's, it's almost undoable. So those people just suffered. And what makes matters worse is when you have that kind of dryness, it's a chronically worsening condition. So to get in and treat it early would be ideal. And this LipaFlow machine gave us the, the opportunity to, to, to make an oasis for these people who have been having this burning and discomfort where we really didn't have any treatments before. So you are one of the first to offer this in, in the region, right? I wear, I wear a, a really unique hat with this. I was the first optometrist in the world outside of the clinical trial to have this machine. Wow. And I was, I'm the first doctor in the Washington area to have it. And I've, as a result, um, have the most experience and have done, our practice has done the most procedures with it to date, almost 100 procedures so far. Okay, Impressive. that's awesome. Yeah. So this makes for great stats. Out of those 100 people, what kind of success rate are we talking about? I was hoping you'd ask that. We, the, the clinical study showed about an 80% success rate, and that's about what we're seeing in our practice. Okay. Yeah. Are there certain factors that are tied to someone not respond to this type of treatment? Yes. There's a diagnostic machine that comes along with the treatment. We measure you on that, and it tells us how thick that oil layer of your tears is. And if the oil layer is above a certain thickness, we can apply other treatments to help just add comfort. If it's below a certain level, it's almost a done deal that, that that's the problem and that the LipaFlow will help 80% of the time. Great. Really changed some people's lives with this. Um, that's awesome. It's been very exciting. I, what's involved? I mean, is it painful? No pain. No pain. It's a simple 12-minute, one-time-a-year application. That's it. And it takes about a month for the results to start. And then once they start, they get better and better over the next 9 to 12 months. 
then you would need the treatment once a year. It's very easy. It actually has been compared by a lot of my patients to having a hot rock spa treatment on their eyelids. And these are people who are very uncomfortable. So sitting there, getting the moist and the warmth all, you know, all on the eye for 12 solid minutes is very relaxing. Some people really freak out about anything going near or on or into their eyes. Um, are there any risk factors that are out there associated with this treatment? I mean, the, what, are the, what are the biggest concerns that you can help alleviate for people who are really considering this treatment? There, there are very large contact lenses that gently attach to the eyelid just to get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. I was the first person in my practice that had it. I don't have dry eyes, but I didn't want to offer the procedure to anyone and tell them, oh, I haven't had it myself. Uh, the number one risk of this is getting an eye scratch. The eye scratch would be no more severe than a, you know, a, a paper or a fingernail or something like that. Uh, we haven't had anyone get an eye scratch out of the 100 people yet. It's very rare. Um, there really are, there's, there's a risk of burning the eyelids, but that just is something that they talk about and never happens because the temperature is fixed uh, only up to 45 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So it can't get hot enough to burn your lids. But that's something that, that on the informed consent that people sign off on about. And some irritation, some redness, or some other risks, but they go away by the next day. And this can help someone who is already wearing lenses or even someone who's had LASIK procedures help these people as well? Yeah, well, LASIK is a great example. A lot of people have post-LASIK dry eye. Some of that is related to low tears. But some people had this pre-existing condition of, of not having enough oils. Then they got LASIK, and that just put it over the edge. So mm -hmm. this is perfect for them. It's perfect for people who can't wear contacts because they have this evaporative type of dry eye. They have a good chance of being able to wear them again. And it's, it's very, very much uh, relevant to... Uh, people in their 40 and up who are suffering from age-related dryness, which 85% of the time, up to 85% of the time, is because of this evaporative problem. Wow, interesting. Well, that's great. I remember you talk about people being, uh, you know, weirded out by touching their eye. Yeah. I got contacts when I was 12 years old. Uh, and I, the only time I ever wore them, I was a catcher in baseball. And I couldn't put the mask on over my glasses. Mm -hmm. And so I had to wear contacts. It took me over an hour to put my contacts in the first few times because I just couldn't touch my eye. Now it's, it's, it's no big deal. So I, I know, you know uncomfortableness with the eye, especially when it's dry. I mean, people don't want anything. So this has to be a huge thing that patients are just raving about. It's the most sensitive part of the body. And, and with respect to the, in, the insertion and removal learning process, I can honestly say in, in my whole career at Shady Gravine Vishigar, we've had two people who couldn't learn two people out of thousands. We have an amazing staff that really takes their time. We'll never get frustrated with somebody who wants to learn. But again, if they're dry, the, 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 treat, the, the, uh, the, the strategy to get somebody back in contact who has dryness is to treat the dryness first. Sure. It's a physiological problem. Then get them in the contact. Don't try and keep trying contact after contact, trying to get it right. That's usually a way to spin wheels and frustrate people and ultimately not meet your goals. So we've got about a minute before we go to sure. break. Really quick, I just want to know how long do the effects last of this treatment? About a year. About a year. Uh, this, the clinical study showed 9 to 15 months, but about a year. We, we recommend people, because this is a potentially chronic condition that gets worse and worse and worse, treatment once a year, make it part of your lifestyle so you don't end up with the severe form of dry eyes that's incurable. Prevention goes a long way, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, folks, this has been an awesome beginning to the show. We have a lot more to talk about. We're going to talk about new inventions from Dr. Glazier. We're going to talk about sports and eye care. So come right back, and we'll be, uh, we'll be learning some more stuff about eye care. Hands can do incredible things. Now they can even help save a life with hands-only CPR. If you see an adult suddenly collapse, just call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Learn more at handsonlycpr.org. Welcome back to Living Healthy, where we're joined by Dr. Alan Glazier. I tell you, this has been a great time. I'm peering deep into your eyes. I think we're getting some great eye, eye care stuff. Um, you know, one of the things that my dad recently told me is that he has a mild case of macular degeneration. Uh, and you were saying that your mom has, yep. has the same thing. Yes, I've been diagnosed. Uh, I know this is a common thing. Tell us a little bit about what exactly macular degeneration is. 
Now, right now, it's the number one blinding eye condition uh, in people over the age of 65. Wow. Uh, it's been that way for a while, especially with the aging baby boomer population. Um, the macula is an area in the back of the eye in the, ret in the retina that's responsible for almost 90% of everything we see. Everything you look directly at or focus on, when the macula gets wiped out by disease, and there are many diseases that degenerate the macula, but if it gets wiped out by this age-related change, then you, you cannot see detail uh, at, at distance or near. Uh, you never go totally blind. You can navigate your environment okay, but you couldn't see my face looking at me, and you couldn't get around the blank spot it's right dead center, which makes it very hard to read or see things up close. Um, people get robbed of their vision in their golden years. They can't see pictures of the grandchildren. They can't read, sit and read a magazine or a book. And, and what do you want to do when you're retired? You want to have hobbies. You want to work with your hands, maybe do things like, and it's just impossible for them. So it's devastating blindness. Uh, it sounds it. Um, I, I hope that I don't, but, but um, if any of us do, what can we do about it now? What do you have? We, we live in an amazing age. In 2007, uh, there was a, a, a drug came out called uh, Lucentis uh, or Avastin. These two drugs came out. And if the, the, the devastating form of macular degeneration, which is the wet form, was diagnosed within a, a short window of time, 48 hours or so, you can get treatment with this drug and it can re reabsorb the damage and restore vision in many cases to better than 2030 again. Uh, so it, quick diagnosis was crucial. Um, it, it's been an amazing drug. It works, I believe, in 45 to 60 percent of patients who have it. And then followed up by regular visits to your retinologist to monitor it and make sure that, that it, it stays resorbed. The, the dry, that's the wet form, which is the more devastating type. The dry form, which is, I think, what you both said you had um, family members with that. The dry form, uh, there's no way to prevent it. Um, there's some data to suggest that lifestyle changes, uh, specifically intake of leafy green vegetables, specifically spinach with lutein and zazanthine, which are the two vitamins that go right to the macula and protect it is helpful. There are vitamins in the stores like Preservision and Occuvite and several others that also can supplement the intake of these vitamins that protect the back of the eye. But uh, you know, we, we don't really know what vitamins our body absorbs and what, don't, what, what, what it doesn't. So making sure that you get that spinach, the kale, the collard greens, those are the things that have these particular vitamins and it's, it's crucial if you have a family history. I mean, that's, that's great information for everybody out there. You know, you've given them some information about the pharmacologic treatment and the nutritional uh, treatments as well, the nutritional things they can do to, to prevent this from occurring or maybe feel better. But you've also developed a product. You've got a patent. You're being um, you're very humble, but you've developed this amazing product called Liquilens. So, you know, tell everybody out there about Liquilens. Well, um, I... Um recognized an unmet need. Uh, these people who have macular degeneration and vision loss, if it's stable, they still can't see. They're not getting any worse, but they can't function. They can't do the things they want to do. So uh, I came up with a way to optically correct this for them. These are people who you may see on buses or in public transports or at work who have these huge magnifying devices that are looking very closely at stuff. And magnifying devices on their own have some problems associated with them. They have barrel distortion. If you hold a magnifying glass up, you can see things towards the edge curve, which limits their field of view. Also, the nature of magnification is such that the, the higher the magnification, the closer people have to hold things to see it. Well, I've figured out a way to get that magnification inside of the eye, which re eliminates that distortion. It enables much more give in terms of the, uh, the, your ability to look at near and the way the lens works is in straight ahead gaze the near focus goes away so on down gaze based on gravity people are able to get that additional magnification and then when they look up it goes away. That's phenomenal. Now this is truly an international product. So you've worked with other governments as well to help get this product to market. So tell us about your relationship with the government of Estonia. Well, we, we were fortunate to get involved in a grant funding project in the European Union um, and Estonia uh, who is building their economy on um, medical device uh, they're an emerging economy. They're highly motivated, highly technically skilled, very bright people, very excited about this technology. Awarded us a grant uh, a year and a half ago, and we were awarded a second conditional grant, um, which is conditional on us raising additional funds, and we're working on getting that done now as well. But the, the end result will be the, the additional funds, the grant money, which will get us to, towards market in Europe. It's phenomenal. Uh, you walk into his office and you see all these patents on the wall. That's amazing. You know, just really great stuff. Uh, so w what, when can we expect to see this on the market? Uh, if, if 
we, uh, things move along according to plans, um, four to six years, uh, uh, three to five years in Europe, and then maybe fast-tracking here, we're hoping, because there's such a need. Uh, it, also, uh, it also solves a problem in, a, in another parallel market, with, which is a billion dollars as well, people who have cataracts removed but can't read up close as well. So it works on down gaze for reading for people who have what we call presbyopia, which we talked about in the first segment. Mm -hmm. Presbyopia, post-cataract, they normally would have to put on reading glasses. But these devices in, in those type of patients are called accommodating intraocular lenses. They accommodate your vision from near to far. So there are really two parallel markets for this. We're going to help a lot of people, we hope. Fantastic. Uh, that's really cool. That's really cool. Well, I, I hope that this all works. I hope that the, uh, the you know, Estonian government and, and the Europeans are, are working as good uh, lab rats. Um, and, uh, and then we can get it in, in, uh, into everyone around the world that is suffering from uh, this macular degeneration and, and uh, even cataracts, as you said. Uh, all right, so let's shift gears a little bit here. Let's, let's move into something uh, that, that is also of, of equal interest, which is the use of the eye in sports. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's something that is, is largely overrated, and I think one of the first times that we met, Dr. Glazer, was years ago we did a football camp with Javon Hamden. Yes. And uh, you were talking at that time about how uh, certain receivers might have, let's say, a left dominant eye that where they see better out of the left, and they would struggle when running down, let's say, the left side of the field, turning back to the right where they were using their non-dominant eye, and they couldn't see very well something it just blew me away because I realized here I am a physical therapist working on the body and I had never considered the eye as being important in sports and it was just I completely missed it you know so tell us about it you remind me how much stuff we've done together you know that was a great day <laughs> that, that was, was fantastic a great time. and uh, I don't even remember that that child that we mm -hmm. saw out there and I was watching how, what a talented athlete was but he couldn't grab the ball and so these are the kind of things that, that, that there are many approaches to help treat, like, may, first of all, make sure they're, they're corrected. A lot of these kids uh, haven't even had an eye exam. And it's not that they're, they're not functioning at their best athletic ability, they just can't see. So, you know, Pete Rose was quoted, somebody asked him one time how he was such a great hitter. Um, I wanted to see the question how you're such a great gambler. <laughs> they said, I don't know if he was <laughs> But he said, he said, see the ball, hit the ball. It was a very famous quote because it's that simple. If you can see it, you can connect with it. If you can't see it, you're not going to connect with it. Um, and there, there are um, specialists out there. I've worked with um, some patients to improve their hitting through training, exercise through reinforcing actions tied to the visual cortex and, and their vision. Um, but making sure clarity is there is the number one thing. I got interested in this. I'm not a sports vision specialist, but I, I work specifically with baseball players because I'm passionate about baseball. Um, with, with, well, I, had a, I remember a, a young teenage boy whose father was telling me, they brought him in for an eye exam because they were worried about his hitting. And we found that um, he was a righty, and he, his problem wasn't that he couldn't see clearly, but it was that at the plate, he had a very prominent nose bridge. Hmm. So depth is something that's very important for seeing that ball that's pitched. And he would turn, I'm going to look away from the cameras, but he would turn his head like this. His non-dominant eye, because of his nose bridge, his dominant eye was blocked from seeing the release of the pitch. So he would be like this, and he would be swinging and missing because his non-dominant eye was, was doing most of the work. So w w when I watched him and I watched his swing, I said, well, try just turning your chin a little more forward. And when he did, and his dominant eye kicked in, his batting average went way up. Well, that's and, you know, so that's just one small example of the many skills that if you're, if you're an astute observer of your patients and listening to their problems and they're involved in sports that you can help them with, mostly with the small ball sports. Although with the big ball sports, there are other challenges. Think of basketball for a second. This is a really interesting one. You can shoot a foul shot when you're static. Or you can dribble and, and jump to the right and hit another shot. It takes a different kind of vision acuity. Vision acuity 2020 is shooting a foul shot. But dynamic visual acuity, how you see while you're moving, is another thing. And the, these are all things that can be trained and helped. I, mean, I remember at the camp, and I've been to your office before, you have some really interesting diagnostic ways to evaluate some of these issues with, with, the, with the patients. So um, when, does, when does an athlete or when does a parent know when to come and see you for these types of issues? How do they know what they don't know? 
That's a good question. I, I think the athletes that are at the top of their game are going to look at this right away. This is going to be one of the things they go. They go to their annual physical. Mm -hmm. They have their blood work done. They make sure that they're, they're physically fit with, with their uh, physical therapists and chiropractors. And then they have their eyes checked. I, I, I just, if it's a ball sport, I don't see any way that, that leaving that out of the picture is going to help their, their career. And if they're serious about it, they'll do that. It makes total sense. I mean, I remember watching Carlos Rogers, you know, first round draft pick, I believe. Um, out of Auburn, you know, everybody's really excited to have him here. Guy couldn't catch the ball. Hands of steel. Yeah, I mean, it made me crazy. And then all of a sudden, you know, he goes to San Francisco, probably went to an eye doctor out there, and you know, he had like six or seven, eight interceptions. Yeah. Uh, you know, his career changed. So um, it's it's frustrating for the fan as well. You want these athletes to, you, know, you want your team to win. You want them to perform well. That's right. That's right. Speaking of career changing. Uh, they, they talk about in baseball a guy like Bryce Harper, who had you know is a five tool athlete. I mean, hitting, running, cat fielding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there was a lot in the news recently about him just getting some contact lenses, and uh, you, how much that helped his hitting. I mean, he went from a guy that had a decent average, decent power, to this year. I mean, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal baseball player. What what what, what happened there? Oh, Bryce Harper, who who another. If there was a seventh tool, it'd be Hart. Because he's all hard out there. I mean, I've never seen anybody try as hard as he does. He's phenomenal. Uh, his, I was friends with his eye doctor um, from when he was in the minors. Um, and, you know, without disclosing anything of patient confidentiality, because I don't know myself, but, you know, they probably checked to see that he was seen clearly. Um, they probably checked to make sure that his depth perception was working well. And they probably gave him some of the type of advice like I just gave you before. I mean, the, the pe doctors who work with athletes frequently have ways of helping them to spruce up their, their abilities. Um, their peripheral vision, that's a big one. Um, you can actually expand your peripheral visual field through training. So, and that's been proven. And the eye teaming, how the eyes follow, how they work together, the, what's called saccadic pursuits, how they quickly move around to catch a, ba a bouncing ball and be, a, a, to be able to adjust physically to get that. These are all things that, that likely were worked on with uh, Bryce Harper. That, that's something that hockey goalies have probably as much as any sport, uh, their ability to see that puck, uh, to see you know, almost 180 degrees peripherally, yes. uh, and, and how it bounces and all those tips. I mean, they, they have amazing visual acuity. And yeah. visual, visualization skills are important, too. Just uh, kind of a, a very zen-like closing the eyes and visualizing all the scenarios and then seeing them with your real eyes. Those connections are really important in the brain. You know, I think about what we do every single day, and we work on everything from, you know, obviously decreasing pain, but also... Uh, performance and improve proprioception and that coordination and body awareness and it seems like you know we have to we have to integrate more as a healthcare team I mean what you do integrates so well with what we do you know we can fix the mechanic side we can improve the neurology side but incorporating the eyes is really really important so you know I think we need to encourage you know providers to work together and hopefully have more multidisciplinary conversations like this absolutely I like that this, this has been a this has been an uh, eye opening show. <laughs> I had to he say, said it. I had to say, it. I had to finish. It's eye opening. Uh, but but in all seriousness, um, you're a phenomenal optometrist. How can people get a hold of you? Oh, well, our practice is on Shady Grove Road and Research Boulevard. The phone number there is three zero one six seven zero one two one two. Uh, my email you can reach me personally at my personal email aglazier at youreyesight dot com. Uh, we are uh, on Twitter at info and on Facebook at Optometrist Rockville. Uh, our, op our doctors see patients on an appointment basis, but the optical is open between 9 and 7 weekdays, Fridays 9 to 5, and Saturdays 9 to 2, and we offer advanced optical options as well. That's fantastic. 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 Yeah, I got my glasses from him, too. Yeah. Um, so, folks, thanks so much for being with us today. This was an absolutely fantastic show. My good friend, our good friend, Dr. Alan Glazier, thank you so much for being here. Next week, we have another phenomenal guest, a very distinguished pediatrician. Dr. Victor Abdow is going to talk about pediatrics, ADD, and ADHD, and how he can help your patients, uh, your, your kids, excuse me. So, thanks so much for joining us on Living Healthy. Um, I'm Dr. Jay Greenside on behalf of Dr. Bishop and Dr. Glazier. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next week.